you've been studying the uh, song, the topic of being in need, we obviously are in need before the Lord. We're in need, in need of very many things. And uh, the song dealt with several of those. I came up with another thing we're in need of that's maybe basic and fundamental the song didn't start with. I thought it'd be good to finish up with, with this. We are in need of instruction. We are in need of knowledge of God and his word and his will. And I want to talk about that with you tonight. That, that's the base of everything. We need God's teaching. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. We don't know in ourselves where to go or what to do. We need instruction. Unfortunately, people often look the wrong place for instruction. They look oftentimes to themselves. In John chapter 16, Jesus talks about the persecutions that the disciples would face. And he says in verse 2, they will make you an outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. They'll kill you thinking that's what God wanted them to do. What we think about things is, not off, is often not right. We need God's instruction to guide and shape our thinking. Or you can think about a passage like Acts 26, when Paul was talking about how he thought. He says in verse 9, So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. When Paul was persecuting Christians, he thought he was doing the right thing. When he looked to himself, when he, when he figured things out on his own, he was totally wrong. He thought something that was not right. He needed God's instruction. Uh, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends are the ways of death, Proverbs 14, 12, and also Proverbs 16, 25. There's ways that seem right to us. There's things that seem right to us by our intuition or by our logic, by our feelings. But we cannot look inward to find out the proper instructions as to what we're to do and be. But we also can't look outward. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One of the things that Paul dealt with so much in 1 Corinthians was their emphasis on human wisdom. He says in verse 18 of chapter 1, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Worldly wisdom, what man thinks, what man decides is so wise, is not our source of instruction either. What wisdom of the world is not wise. He says in verse 318, 1 Corinthians 318, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. God says human wisdom is not our source of instruction, should not be. And so often we look to that. We look to scientists, we look to theologians, we look to philosophers, we look to scholars, we look to therapists, we look to all kinds of places other than to the Lord for our instruction, for our direction, to know what's right. We can't look in and we can't look out. We need the Lord for instruction. We need the Lord to teach us what we're to do and how we're to do it. I'd like to look with you at some passages that show that. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9 is an interesting situation. This is while they're still on Mount Sinai, but near the end of that time, you know, they spent a year on Mount Sinai, more or less, and they were around to the time for the Passover, the first Passover after the real one that they had left Egypt uh, by. And so in Numbers chapter 9, uh, Moses says in verse uh, 2, Now let the sons of Israel observe the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month, at twilight, you shall observe it at its appointed time. You shall observe it according to all its statutes and according to all its ordinances. Do it right, and here's when you do it. So Moses told the sons of Israel to observe the Passover. They observed the Passover in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the sons of Israel did. But there were some men who were unclean because of the dead person, so that they could not observe Passover on that day. 
So they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. Those men said to him, Though we are unclean because of the dead person, why are we restrained from presenting the offering of the Lord at its appointed time among the sons of Israel? You see the situation? There's a prescribed date for the Passover. They're supposed to observe it just like God said, but some had become unclean because of contact with a dead body. And as unclean people, they couldn't observe the Passover. But they come to Moses, they wanted to observe the Passover. You know, some people might be relieved that they didn't have to. That's not the way they felt, thankfully. They wanted to be able to share in that worship of God. So they came to Moses and said, we're unclean because of the dead body, but we really want to observe the Passover. Can't we do that? Now, what would you have said had you been Moses? I can think I might have said, well, you know, you were providentially hindered from partaking of that Passover. You were under some extenuating circumstances, and God will understand, and you just take the Passover next year. Hopefully, nobody will die near you next year, and you'll be able to take it then. It's just kind of the way it is. Sometimes people can't. You know, if you can't, you can't. I think I'd have probably said that. Some other people might have said, you know, the Passover is such an important feast. It's so key in Israel's year that the importance of observing the Passover trumps the cleanliness requirements taken anyway. I can imagine some people would have reasoned that way. I can imagine that you might have come up with some sort of instant purification ceremony. You know, kill a couple of animals and sacrifice them and make some kind of a concoction and, and anoint yourself and you're purified right then and there and you can partake of the Passover. That would have made some sense too. Maybe you could come up with your rationale as to what you would have said. I appreciate what Moses said. Moses said in verse 8, Wait, and I will listen to what the Lord will command concerning you. Great statement. Wait, and I'll listen to what the Lord's will is. That's what we need to do. Something comes up, and we're not sure well, what's right or what's not. Instead of, well, I think it should be this way. I feel like that. This makes sense to me. We should say, wait, let's hear what the Lord says about it. And we research in the scriptures to find out what his will is. That's the ticket. We need, we're in need of instruction from God. Now, what God said surprises me. Verse 9, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If any one of you or of your generations becomes unclean because of a dead person or is on a distant journey, he may, however, observe the Passover of the Lord. In the second month, on the 14th day at twilight, they shall observe it, and so forth and so on. Uh, you can't misuse that. He'll say later on, this is not for people who could have partaken and just chose not to. But if you were really hindered by being in the presence of a dead body or being on a journey, there's a makeup Passover one month later. I don't think that would have ever crossed my mind. A makeup Passover a, a month later, but that's what God said. That's what his will was. There's lots of times that I would have never, ever thought of what God thought of. That just shows you how not wise I am and how much I need to wait and listen to what the Lord's will is. But that attitude on Moses' part, illustrates the fact that we need to seek God's instructions and not answer questions out of our own head. I want you to look on in Numbers 9. They're about to leave Mount Sinai. When are they going to go and where are they going to go? Well, God has some very clear instructions about that. I want you to listen to this whole passage. I'd like for you to listen carefully and try to visualize what he's saying. I think there's something impressive about this passage. Uh, you see if you come up with that as we go. So this is 915, Numbers 915. Now on the day that the tabernacle was erected, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and in the evening, it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. So it was continuously. The cloud would cover it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterwards the sons of Israel would then set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the sons of Israel would camp. At the command of the Lord, the sons of Israel would set out, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud settled over the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the sons of Israel would keep the Lord's charge and not set out. If sometimes the cloud remained a few days over the tabernacle, according to the command of the Lord, they remained camped. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they set out. If sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would move out. 
or if it remained in the daytime and at night, whenever the cloud was lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a year, the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it. The sons of Israel remained camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped, and at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. What did you notice in that? A lot of redundancy. He keeps saying it over and over again. When the cloud moved, they moved. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. They acted just exactly what the Lord said. When the Lord commanded, they set out. When the Lord told them to stop, they stopped. And he says it, and he says it, and he says it, and he says it, because he's trying to emphasize that point, that idea of relying on the Lord's direction, doing exactly what he says when he says it. We don't act independently. We act just exactly as the Lord has said. That is such a powerful lesson for us. We need to see the Lord's word as our cloud. When it speaks, we, we act. When he doesn't, we stay. We act only at the direction of what he says. That's the message, the lesson of the cloud. And it's a lesson that we're in need of God's instruction. Turn back a page or two with me to Numbers chapter 7. I believe I'm right that this is the second longest chapter in the Bible. But if you skim down through it, you'll see why it's not one of the most likely ones to be read very carefully. It's pretty redundant. But the first part of this says some things that are very important. This is where the Israelite tribes are bringing an offering to Moses. And they bring before the Lord in verse 3, this is number 7, 3, six covered carts and 12 oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders and an ox for each one. And they presented them before the tabernacle. So God tells Moses to accept these carts and oxen. These are six carts, 12 oxen. And he is to distribute them to the families of Levi. Levi had three sons. And those three families were responsible for carrying various parts of the tabernacle when they would set out and they dismantle the tabernacle, carry it to wherever they stopped, and then they'd set it up again. So look at this. In verse 6, so Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two carts and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. The Gershonites, I remember this this way, this is kind of stupid, but the Gershonites carried the girly parts of the tabernacle, the veils and the cloths and the coverings and all that kind of stuff. And they got two carts, four oxen. Then verse 8, four carts and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service. The Merari people carried the man, the Merari man. They carried the boards and the structure of the tabernacle. And for that, which would have been heavier, I presume, you had four carts and eight oxen. But verse 9, but he did not give any to the sons of Kohath, because theirs was the service of the holy objects which they carried on their shoulders. None to the Kohath people of Levi, because they were carrying the holy objects, like the table and the altars and the ark and those kind of things, and they carried them with poles inserted into rings, and they carried them on the shoulders of those Kohathites. They did not get any carts or any oxen. That's the Lord's instruction about the carts and the oxen, and the transportation of the tabernacle. Move way past that now to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13 is several hundred years later. And David, you, well, you remember, let's get our history straight. So you remember that there was a problem with the Ark of the Covenant, that the Israelites had gone into battle with the Philistines. That was in the days of Eli and his horrible sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And the Israelites lost two battles in a row with the Philistines. And in the second battle, the Philistines took the ark back to Philistine territory. Remember, 
that kind of had a deal with Dagon in his temple, and then there were the tumors in the places where the ark went. Finally, they sent it back, shipped it back over to Israel with two cows that made a beeline right for Israel with no instruction. Clearly, God wanted the ark back, but it was set there for a while before finally David comes. And David has conquered Jerusalem. He set up his government there, and he'd like the ark to be there in, in what's going to become the capital city, the place where God caused for his name to dwell. And so he gets all the people together, and they're going to move that ark, the ark of God, the ark that symbolizes the presence of God. And this is exciting, and this is a very reverent spiritual time. And so in verse uh, 5, this is 1 Chronicles 13, 5, so David assembled all Israel together from the Shihor of Egypt, even to the entrance of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim. David and all Israel went up to Baalah, that is, to Kiriath-Jerim, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord, who is enthroned above the cherubim, where his name is called. They carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, even with songs and with lyres, harps, tambourines, cymbals, and with trumpets. They are praising and worshiping God. They're excited about this. They're celebrating. They're bringing the holy ark of God into Jerusalem. When they came to the threshing floor of Kaidan, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. I don't know if it nearly toppled over or nearly slid off the cart, but at any rate, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady it. The anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. Then David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and he called that place Perazuzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? And he just left it right there. He's not going to do anything more. He's put out with God, very frustrated with God's outburst. He doesn't think God should have done that. They were trying to do this for the Lord. They were worshiping and celebrating before God, and hey, look at what God did to ruin the whole parade. Well, after some months, David reflected and realized this wasn't the right thing. And in 15.2 of 1 Chronicles, David said, No one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. Ah, that's a good plan. That is what the Lord had in mind, isn't it? And he consecrates the Levites in verse 11 and 12, verse 13, because you did not carry it at the first the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. There was the problem. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. The sons of the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles thereon, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. David needed to listen to the Lord's instruction. God was not the one responsible for the outburst. David hadn't carried the ark the way God had given the pattern to, for the ark to be carried. The Kohathites got no oxen and no carts. God did not intend for the holy objects to be carted, but to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. When David did it right, everything was great. When he didn't seek the Lord's instruction, God made the outburst on them. God intends for us to seek the Lord's instruction, for us to, for us to do what Moses did. Wait! and I'll listen to the Lord. We may have to search the scriptures to find out what the Lord's will is. Is that too much to ask? We need to know what God's will is and, and depend on that. We need Lord, the Lord's instruction for what we do. In Isaiah chapter 8, there's an interesting situation in Isaiah where God has asked Ahaz not to make an alliance with the Assyrians, but to trust God. God said to Ahaz, greatly generous on the part of the Lord, he said to Ahaz, just name your sign. I'll give you any sign you want. Make it as high as the heavens. I don't care what it is. Ask for a sign. I'll give it to you to prove that I can deliver Israel and you don't need to make the alliance with the Assyrians. And Ahaz said, oh, I wouldn't want to test the Lord. And what he really meant is I've already decided to make the contract with the Assyrians. I don't really trust the Lord. Well, in Isaiah's day, there were so many people who were just, had just, they didn't trust the Lord anymore. Well, what happens when you don't trust the Lord? Well, you feel insecure. And so you have to trust something. And in Isaiah 8, 19, when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? 
Should they not consult? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? So here's the deal, and it's what happens in our day. People feel the need for some supernatural guidance. If they don't turn to God, they're going to turn to something. Here, to the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter and communicate with the dead, supposedly. What in the world do the dead know about how to stay alive? You know, why talk to them? I love verse 20. Isaiah says, to the law and to the testimony. That's the thing. Cut out the seeking God's will in all these false ways. Go to the law and to the testimony. I think that would be a great slogan. We could have a slogan. That'd be a good one. To the law and to the testimony. We want to go to God's word to find out. I don't care what all the psychics and spiritists and palm readers and horoscope readers and whatever in the world say about it. I want to know what God says. We need the instruction of God. We're deeply in need of that. Nothing that the world offers can hold a candle to what God says. That's what Isaiah had learned. Isaiah was a great prophet in a difficult time, to the law and to the testimony. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, coming to the New Testament for a moment, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. There's where we find God's will, in the Scripture. The Scripture is profitable for everything we need. All the instruction we need is in the Scripture. The man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We need nothing else. But you know what our tendency is if you keep reading in 2 Timothy? I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn, aside, turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. People want to hear the things that make them happy. They want to hear a message that conforms to their desires instead of hearing the instruction from the Lord. And so people will find teachers that will tell them what they want to know. Somebody's in an in a adulterous marriage situation, and they shop around for a church that will accept them. They shop around for a preacher that will tell them it's okay. Or whatever our pet sin is. We want to find some place that says, that's ah, fine. God, God won't care. Instead of listening to what the Lord says, he's the one we need to listen to. He's the one we need to please. In Jeremiah chapter 23, look back there for a moment. Jeremiah 23 talks about the false prophets, of which there were so many in his day and are so many in our day. In Jeremiah 23, verse 13, Moreover, among the prophets of Samaria I saw an offensive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. Among the prophets of Jerusalem I've seen a horrible thing. The committing of adultery and walking in falsehood, and they strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one is turned back from his wickedness. You see what the false teaching does? The false teaching kind of like anesthetizes our conscience. It makes it to where it seems okay to do wrong. And that's the problem. False teachers don't bring about people's repentance and serving God because they teach something that God has not authorized. They teach us to go in man's ways instead of God's ways. We are in need of instruction from the Lord. In verse 16 here in Jeremiah 23, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. Now, there is the criteria of a true or false prophet. Are they speaking God's message or the message out of their own head? Does it come from the book? Does it come from the Lord? Or does it come from somebody's thinking? That's their problem. He said, they keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you will have peace. As for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say calamity will not come upon you. They tell people they're fine when they're not obeying God. They salve their conscience. They make them feel good. People say, have you heard people say before, you know, when I go to church, I want to feel good. I have enough stress in my life already. I don't want a message of hellfire and brimstone. I don't want a bunch of thus says the Lord's. I, I want to be uplifted. I want to have encouragement. 
Well, if we're not doing what's right, we need exhortation and admonition to correct our lives and to please the Lord. We need his instruction. Whether we like it or not, whether that's what we think we want or not, it's a blessing when we hear the words of God that will lead us back to him. In verse 21, I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. A, I didn't send them. I didn't give them that message. They dreamed it up on their own. And B, if they had taught my message, they would have caused people to turn back to God. They would have turned them away from their evil way and would have blessed them. God's truth will help people to follow him. Messages from our own head will only sap people's consciences as they're not doing the will of God. In, in Jeremiah 28, there's an interesting case study. This prophet Hananiah says thus in verse 2, Jeremiah 28, 2, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I'm going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house which Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took away from this place and carried to Babylon, and so forth and so on. There is an impressive false prophet. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts. He says it. You know, he probably says it, thus says the Lord of hosts. You know, he's got that, that preacher voice, and he's got that impressive aura. Within two full years, those vessels we brought back to Jerusalem. You can just hear the electricity in the air, feel the electricity in the air, and he's telling things that are totally out of his own head. None of it comes from God. We have to be careful. There are people who sound good. They use passages, twist them. Satan used passages when Jesus' temptation. And, and they sound, they sound so, so authentic. We've got to keep our guard up and be careful that we're not misled by somebody who sounds good but isn't revealing what the Lord says. In this particular case, he even theatrically broke the yoke God had put on the neck of Jeremiah to theatrically say, that's what God's going to do with the yoke on your neck. And Jeremiah at first doesn't say a word because he doesn't have any word from the Lord to give. He said, I hope you're right. <laughs> but on the other hand, most of the prophets who prophesied in the era like this have prophesied repentance. But I hope you're right. Then God speaks to him and he says, you're going to die, Hananiah. And the same prophet who said the holy vessels would come back within two years died within two months. Shows you what God thought of his prophecy. So we've got to, we need instruction from God. We need it badly. And we need to have discernment to see whether people are teaching us the truth or not. Is there a message from the book or not? We need to know the book. We need to examine everything that's said. And we need to make sure that when we need a message of exhortation, we're not just getting a bunch of messages of comfort to salve us in our, salve our conscience and our sin. Now, there's a lot of people who are leaving this idea that we need instruction from the Lord. A lot of people who are not so concerned about following the Lord's will strictly and are more open to other perspectives and other insights and other ideas. I want to close the lesson for the next few minutes by talking about some of the reasons, I think, people are abandoning the feeling that we have to have a thus says the Lord for everything we do. People who are not insisting on listening to God and receiving instruction from God. And I think these, these reasons why people are doing that are good exhortations for us. I think one reason people are abandoning the Lord is they don't know the book. They don't know the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, anybody could come along and tell you something. If he says it well, it'll, it'll sound impressive. I can remember when I was a kid, I occasionally was able to attend a religious debate it's kind of obsolete these days, but they had them back then. And I sometimes even read, read them. I can remember being so frustrated because the first guy who'd speak, I'd say, yeah, that sounds good. That's right. The next guy would speak and refute him. I'd say, no, he's right. Then the guy would get, but, but rebut him and, no, he's right. <laughs> Every one I heard, I just, it, it sounded good to me. It sounded right because I didn't know the Bible well enough to be able to critique it. And it was frustrating. I had to study a lot more and get to the point where I could say when this one was speaking, wait a minute, that's not what that passage is saying. That's out of context or that you didn't even read it right or whatever it was. But it takes study. It takes effort to learn the word 
We need to be people of the book. I don't care who you are. You may say, well, I'm no teacher. It doesn't matter. You're a learner. You're a listener. And you need to be able to dis distinguish the truth from error. We need to know whether it's God's word or not. So that's one problem is we, we don't know what's right. We don't know the truth. How are we going to be able to determine truth from error? A second thing I think is really a problem for us. As we have become, we in a broad sense, more affluent, more educated, more socially acceptable, more influential, we have greater status, it's hard for us to think of our friends as being wrong. It's hard for us to be identified with a church that most people around us don't think much of. It's not one of those churches everybody says, oh yeah, I've heard of that church, that's a great church, they have all these programs and one thing or another. We are often influenced by wanting to unite with our friends and not wanting to see a difference. We want to believe everybody's okay. Well, all evangelicals are okay. Well, all, all people who say they're Christians are okay. And to stand up and say, wait a minute, this is a false teaching. They may call themselves a servant of God. They may call themselves a prophet or a disciple or whatever. But when you examine what they're saying, it's not true. When you examine what they're doing, it's not right. We need to be willing to be persecuted, to be defamed, to be spoken against. Jesus was. Paul didn't get run out of city after city because he told everybody what they wanted to hear. We need to be willing to stand up for truth, stand up for the Lord, stand up for his will and his way, no matter what it costs us. Maybe our friends will think, oh, I've heard of that group. You guys are the people who think you're the only ones going to heaven, right? Or whatever they say about that. And we have to live with the fact that they're not going to approve of, the, of our teaching, and we have to try to teach them the truth so that they can be saved. Sometimes we don't want that. A third reason people are abandoning this need, feeling the need for God's instruction is because of unresolved sin issues in their life. I'll tell you one of the things that makes it hardest for us to understand the Bible is when I feel guilty, when I know I'm not being what I ought to be. Because, you know, it's kind of like, well, I'm not following the Lord in this. Well, how does it matter if they're following the Lord in that? You know, if I'm not obeying God, how can I expect anybody else to? We really need the Lord to get the sin out of our life. We need to put off the old man and put on the new man. We theoretically did that at one point. We better live it. If you've got, gone back to that old man, get rid of him. Renew your thinking. Turn to brethren to help you, to strengthen you, to be accountable to. But when we're harboring sin in our heart, when we're messing with our phones and computers and looking at a bunch of stuff we shouldn't or whatever other sin we may be committing, that's going to just destroy our, our willingness to listen to the Lord's instruction about anything else. Sin, sin is such a terrible thing that's so destructive on our will to do what's right. A fourth thing is sometimes our religion is just so hollow. If all we're doing is coming to church and going through the motions just because we feel better about it, it doesn't help us. It doesn't convict us. It doesn't transform us. We've got to do what we do in the Lord with all our heart. If, if, we're just, if we've left our first love, if it's just a mechanical routine for us, we don't really love God, we don't really praise God, and we don't really care that much about Him, we just feel like we've got to go, we've got to do a few religious things, we're going to be vulnerable to anybody who comes along and says something we like to hear. Because we're not really that committed, we're not really that fervent, we're not really that enthusiastic for the Lord anyway. So we've got to make sure that what we're doing is really an expression of love and praise to God. We care about him, and we're giving our all to God. And then finally, I think our pride is a problem. You know, it's hard to not, you know, want to think we know more than God. It's hard to submit ourselves to what he says. Sometimes what he says doesn't make a lot of sense to us. It wasn't what we'd say. And in our pridefulness, a lot of times we think we know better than what God does. We wouldn't say it that way. When it's all said and done, we argue with the scriptures and decide we know what's right as opposed to what it says. You know, the thing we're learning in all this, we're in need. We're in need of God's instruction. That's the place where we have to start. We need to know what his will is. We need to, like Moses, wait and listen to what the Lord says. Like he told the Israelites, follow the cloud. Where it stops, you stop. When it sets out, you set out. The Lord's word is our cloud. 
We need to be careful to follow his instructions. If he says, no oxen, no carts, it means no oxen, no carts. You just do it the way he says to do it. Uh, and, and in everything, we go to the law and to the testimony. We want to know what God's will is, and that's what we follow. I think this is as basic as anything could be, but it's what we need. We need to be really focused on the Lord and his word. We need to know it. We need to be committed. We're going to follow it no matter what. Whether anybody else does or not, whether anybody else in the world thinks that's cool or not, we are committed to God. We love him. We trust him. We fear him. And we're willing to live by his word in everything.